Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending from on where you're joining us. Um, this is uh, uh, a Center for European Research uh, webinar. We are really happy to welcome you today for this uh, webinar on the lessons from the Eurozone crisis, uh, EMU limitations and national bargaining. Actually, we are going to have a discussion and interaction between two uh, recent books uh, that have uh, just come out um, on the topic. Uh, one uh, is uh, on the politics of bad options, why the Eurozone's problems have been so hard to resolve uh, at Oxford University Press uh, by Walter Stephanie, who is here today uh, and has co-authored this book with Ari Ray and Niels uh, Redeker. Uh, it, it already has been published in 2020. And uh, we will have a conversation with the book uh, co-authored by uh, Catherine uh, Mori and Stella Laddie, who are here uh, with us today and also have other co-authors on um, capitalizing on constraint. And they will tell us about also bailout politics in the Eurozone uh, countries. Uh, I'm Dr. Sarah Wolf. I'm the director of the Center for European Research at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and I'm also principal investigator for the next UK uh, Jean Monnet Center of Excellence on the future of EU-UK uh, relations. And even though we're not going probably to speak too much about the UK, I think uh, it is still a nice introduction to understand a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, crisis and, and how uh, crisis management has worked out uh, and what lessons we draw from the Eurozone crisis also for other crises that we have seen Brexit or at the moment, uh, the pandemic and the recovery uh, fund as well. So I'm really glad to have an impressive set of speakers. I'm going to give a very short introduction uh, of uh, each of them. Um, and then I will leave the floor to Stephanie, who will have uh, 10 minutes uh, to introduce the main argument of, of her book. Um, also, I see that we have a lot uh, of participants in the audience, so please also um, prepare your questions towards the end. We will have 30 minutes um, to uh, have a Q&A and I will be uh, strict with time and raise this card when I see that uh, people are going over time. But um, first, uh, welcome to Stephanie. She's a professor of international relations and political economy at the University of Zurich. Um, and uh, she will tell us more about uh, her book that she has co-authored. She will be followed by my uh, colleague Stella, who is from the Center for European Research, Stella Ladi, and also uh, Pantheon uh, University in Athens, who has co-authored uh, this book with Catherine Mori. The book is also um, out with, I think, published with uh, Manchester University Press. And of course, they are both uh, excellent uh, books to read, and I encourage you to, to, to um, buy them and read them, uh, especially because they speak very nicely to each other. Then we have also uh, two discussants who will then uh, react and I'm sure will push further the reflection on, um, on conditionality, on uh, the Eurozone crisis and what we can learn from it also for maybe current uh, situation in the EU. Uh, we have um, uh, Matthias uh, Matthijs, uh, who is uh, joining us um, from uh, the US, I believe, uh, where you're Associate Professor of International uh, Political Economy. Um, and I'm sure you will have uh, a lot to say also on the two books. And my dear colleague, Paul Coughlin from Queen Mary University of London, um, who is also part of the Next UK project, is a, also a previous director of the Center for European Research and has extensively also worked on um, uh, social uh, European uh, policy and Brexit and de-Europeanization. Um, so I think, I hope I didn't miss any crucial information. Uh, I would like just now to leave the floor to Stephanie. You have uh, 10 minutes to uh, present the key findings of your book. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the kind introduction and to Catherine and Stella for organizing this event. I think this is great. And I really like how the two books that we're gonna talk about speak to each other. So I think we're gonna have a lot to talk about. Um, this book is called The Politics of Bad Options. Uh, it's co-authored with Ari Ray and Niels Redeker. Uh, 
this I think might be the audience today. Um, and the motivation that um, got us started on this project is that, of course, the euro crisis has been a major challenge for the EU and for EMU. So it's important to understand why, why it's been so difficult uh, to resolve. It's also really unusual because we've seen such an unequal burden sharing both across and within countries. Um, so uh, we also thought that it's really important to understand how distributive concerns are managed within the Eurozone, how that, especially in this case, in, in the Euro crisis, but I think it has some implications also for Euro, like Euro management more generally. Our book makes three main contributions. The first is it provides a comparative perspective. Many books and papers have been written on the Euro crisis. Many of them have focused on the crisis as sort of a sui generis crisis, as sort of a crisis in and of itself. Um, and I mean, I started out, um, I, I come from research on financial crises. So for me, the Euro crisis was always a financial crisis. And I think it's really interesting to think about it in that context. And the Euro crisis is really unique in some aspects, but I think we better understand where and how it is unique if we compare it to other crises. So one of the contributions of our book is that we put the Eurozone crisis in the context of similar episodes, both of balance of payments and debt crises, but also of surplus um, episodes. Second, we focus on the whole range of policy options that were available to policymakers, at least in theory. So that also means looking at the policy options that were not chosen. And we really want to focus on the trade-offs that these policy options entail. And third, our paper, uh, our book uh, makes a contribution by focusing not just on the de deficit debtor countries, so the crisis countries that have commanded most of the attention in research so far, but also to looking at the other side of the coin and looking at surplus creditor countries. Um, we basically have three main research questions in the book. First, why was the Eurozone crisis resolved in a manner in which some countries bore a much larger share of the pain than other countries? Why did no country leave the Eurozone rather than implement unprecedented austerity? And who supported and opposed the different policy options in the crisis domestically? And how did the distributive struggles among these groups shape crisis politics, both in the crisis countries, but also in the sort of northern surplus countries? We argue that when you're hit by a crisis, you really just have bad, three bad options. And it, the whole book starts from the premise that at the core, um, the, the Euro crisis is a debt and balance of payments crisis. And in order to resolve such crises, you essentially have three options. One is external adjustment, one is internal adjustment, one is financing. Uh, and the interesting thing is that this, you know, this adjustment and also financing can be done either by deficit countries, but it can also be done by surplus countries. External adjustment means adjustment by um, um, of the exchange rate, um, either a devaluation in, in crisis countries or an appreciation in surplus countries. Internal adjustment means domestic reforms, austerity and structural reforms in deficit countries of the type that, that Stella and Catherine describe so uh, adeptly in, in, in their book. Um, and, or in surplus countries, there it means really boosting domestic demand, for example, accepting more inflation. And financing means that deficit countries get more money to finance the gap basically in their current account. Um, and surplus countries need to provide this money to finance this. So this is actually, this, these three adjustment strategies really are available in any kind of, of these debt and balance of payments uh, crises. But it has some implications for the Eurozone context where the context is slightly different because we're talking about a crisis in the currency union. So for the Eurozone, uh, external adjustment really would imply a breakup of the eurozone. The, the you know the exchange rate would have to really be taken apart, essentially, like reintroduce more currencies. Internal adjustment would mean the convergence of deficit in surplus countries in structural terms, and financing essentially means that in the long run, if you want to make this a long long run viable strategy, you need some permanent financing structures. Now, what do different countries or different interest groups of voters or governments, what do they want in the crisis? Our sort of main heuristic through which we look at this is the so-called vulnerability profile. And the vulnerability po profile looks at um, actors' vulnerability to external adjustments, so in the case of the Eurozone, a breakup of the Euro, uh, versus vulnerability to internal adjustment here on the vertical axis. So the vulnerability to austerity and structural reforms in deficit countries or to policies that boost domestic demand in, uh, in surplus countries. And depending on where you find yourself here in this two by two matrix, uh, that determines on what your policy preferences are. If you're really vulnerable to internal adjustment, but not to external adjustment, you will prefer external adjustment, a breakup of the euro in this case. 
if you're only vulnerable to external adjustment, but not really to internal, for example, because you have very late, flexible labor markets or something, then you will prefer internal adjustment. If you're here, you don't, you're not going to have very strong preferences. You're probably not going to want financing. But the really interesting corner is this one. We call this the misery corner because you really don't want to end up here. It's where you, you're vulnerable to both internal and external adjustment. So any kind of reforms is really painful. So this means that actors in this corner should prefer financing. And if financing is not possible, if you're a deficit country, for example, you cannot sort of miraculously procure financing, you depend on someone being willing to grant it, then you're going to see delayed and some mixed adjustment usually. In, in the Eurozone crisis, mixed adjustment is difficult, but in many other bounds of payments crisis, you can see some mixed strategies. Now, we examine this, uh, this argument both on the country level, but also on the interest group and, uh, level. And I have some work that's not really in this book, also on the voter level, but, but, because you can really apply this framework on, on different levels of analysis. The empirical analyses uh, of the book have basically two sets of analyses. The first one looks at deficit debtor countries, those are the crisis countries, with a special focus on Ireland, Greece, and Spain. And the second one looks at surplus creditor countries, with a special focus on Austria, Germany, and the Netherlands. And for each set of countries, we first uh, do a comparative analysis of national vulnerability profiles on the, on the basically um, country level, right? Or like episode level, crisis episode level or, or surplus episode. Um, second, we look at interest group vulnerabilities, preferences, and choices in trade-off situations of interest groups. We collected um, survey data from about 700 interest groups this data is available for download and reuse if you're interested. We're, we're actually interested in people using this data because we only use some of, of the, the things that you could do. It's on my website if you want to find the link. And then we uh, did case studies of domestic crisis politics uh, with document analysis, public opinion data, and uh, 47 interviews that Ari and Nietz conducted. And finally, we conclude with a short analysis of what all of this means for European crisis politics, where we analyze negotiation positions and outcomes of the negotiations. Now I'll go through each of these analyses very quickly, um, but just to give you an idea. So the first set is the country level analysis. And really the question here is, is the Euro crisis special? And we look here at data from 122 countries between 1990 and 2014. We identified 142 balance of payments crisis episodes in this period and 84 episodes of substantial current accounts. And then, and I'm not going to go into detail how we did that, but we basically, for each of these episodes, we calculated measures of vulnerable to vulnerability to external and internal adjustment. On that basis, we constructed national vulnerability profiles per episode, and then we compared Eurozone country vulnerability profiles to those of other episodes. And the interesting thing here is what we highlighted here, these are all the episodes in our data set, and these are the Euro crisis episodes. Here are the deficit countries, and here are the surplus countries. And what you can see is that the Eurozone crisis is not completely distinct. This is a, a, a way in which we can comparatively analyze it. It's, it's not beyond comparison, but it's really unique in the, to the extent that all of these countries, basically almost all of these countries cluster in the mi misery corner. And that then means that these crises really are really politically difficult to resolve. And also that burden sharing is unlikely because it's not just the deficit countries that cluster here, but also the surplus countries that cluster in the misery corner. Then we look at deficit data countries. Um, uh, what we find there is that the majority opposes both external and internal adjustment. Uh, financing policies were viewed much more favorably, not surprisingly, that's what we would expect for countries in the misery corner. Uh, but we also see that there's a, that when we force um, interest groups to choose between the two options, then a clear preference emerges for internal over external adjustment. And we think that this explains why in the end, these countries were willing to actually implement these harsh austerity measures rather than, uh, than leave the Eurozone. What we also see is that there is considerable variation in groups evaluation of specific policies within of these crisis strategies. Uh, and we can see that these evaluations are, as we would expect, related to groups vulnerability profiles. We also see that the concrete design of adjustment strategies matters. And what we then see later on in the, in the case studies is that these preferences also really informed what interest groups wanted in the political process, and that especially employer groups were really uh, successful in pushing through their interests in these countries. Then looking at surplus creditor countries, we find that uh, interest groups in surplus countries were against the breakup of the Eurozone, no surprises here. They were actually indifferent about financing, which is interesting because the public was so opposed. Uh, and perhaps the most interesting thing is that they were slightly positive about internal adjustment overall. 
which is not what we would expect because surplus countries have been really reluctant to adjust internally. Um, but what we also see is, A, there's a really big polarization of policy-specific preferences. So employer groups are really in favor of uh, reducing um, corporate taxes, for example, but really opposed to increasing wages and the other way around for pro poor groups or trade unions, for example. Second, we also find that um, as in the deficit country support, uh, but especially for interim adjustment, support for interim adjustment is very policy specific, right? Um, and when you make people choose, it's easy for them to choose interim adjustment when policies are offered that they like, but it becomes much more difficult for them um, when, um, when you uh, offer them policies that they dislike. And then suddenly support for internal adjustment uh, goes down considerably, right? Now, against this background, one of the key questions I think for the euro crisis is why then, if there was not so much opposition uh, to internal adjustment, why did surplus countries not rebalance more? And what we argue is that there were few political incentives to pursue internal adjustment. There was no strong societal demand for internal adjustment. For voters, it was mostly not a strong issue. There is some variation here. And interest groups, because they were so polarized, didn't really have a strong, they didn't push for like a coherent policy agenda. Second, there were very strong ideological concerns about key policymakers, and if you're interested in that, I strongly recommend Matthias's work on this. And of course, you know, in this context, the surplus countries did have policy alternatives, right? They could just push the adjustment burden onto deficit countries and so basically not enter this conflict domestically. So that was an easy way out. Okay. What then does this mean uh, on the European level? Um, here I use data from a great project that has collected data on negotiation positions. And what we can see here in both of these pictures, we have the average current account balance of the different Eurozone countries uh, before the crisis. So countries further here are surplus countries, countries further here are deficit countries. And what we see is here the average national preferred position in EU Council negotiations on the distribution of adjustment costs. This is more equal sharing of adjustment costs. This is mostly the deficit countries um, uh, share the adjustment costs. And in this case here, it's on financing. Here it's more generous financing for deficit countries and here sort of more conditionality, less financing, right? And not surprisingly, there's sort of a negative relationship. This one is even stronger than this one and deficit countries and surplus countries want different things, right? The interesting thing is with the distribution of adjustment costs, even though the European Parliament and the Commission were actually sort of in the middle uh, uh, and advocated for more equal sharing, the outcome of the negotiations is very much in line with what the, what the surplus countries wanted. So they really, didn't, they really didn't want to adjust and they managed to really not adjust and push the adjustment burden onto the deficit countries. They were more willing to compromise with regard to financing, which is also what we would expect for countries in the misery corner. Um, and here we see an outcome that's more sort of in, in, in the middle. It's still not what the deficit countries really wanted. It's also not what the Commission and the European Parliament wanted. Still more of a compromise, but it's also further away from sort of the ideal position of some of these um, surplus countries. So to summarize, what's so special? Uh, if you look at the euro crisis in a comparative perspective, what is special is that we have countries here uh, that cluster in the misery corner, which makes any type of adjustment uh, politically costly, also economically costly, and that makes crisis resolution very difficult. Um, we see that it, it's important to look at policy alternatives and the trade-offs between the bad options that countries have. I mean, there were really no good options in the crisis. Um, the Euro crisis trajectory has often been seen as very unusual. Like, why did these countries implement such big austerity? It becomes less puzzling if we consider what the alternatives were. Uh, and what we also find is that preferences are policy specific. And finally, I think that our book shows that it's really important to look at both sides of the coin to consider crisis politics, not just in the crisis countries, but also in the surplus creditor countries. And I think uh, what our book shows is that you can analyze uh, the politics in both sets of these countries with an encompassing and a unified theoretical framework. Uh, and what it shows is that the distributive struggles that surrounded the politics of the Eurozone crisis in both sets of countries are distinct, but they also revolve around common themes and are intricately linked. Thank you very much for um, listening. Thank you very much, um, 
Stephanie, and I will now pass on the, the floor to Catherine Mori, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at the Nova University in Portugal, and my colleague Stella Ladi, Senior Lecturer at Queen Mary University of London, and also Assistant Professor at Conteon University. And I think it's, it's a nice transition because you really look at what happened during the negotiations and how uh, the trade-offs were made and how maybe bad options were chosen, right, for some of the member states. But I think your book, uh, Catherine and Stella, is really about looking at how the reforms were implemented. I think you have five countries that you look at and you have a counterintuitive argument because you say, well, actually, uh, we think that these countries have been coerced, that conditionality was imposed on them but you actually go beyond and you show, I think quite interestingly, that uh, some countries have been able to exploit or to, to use a little bit the, this conditionality to their own advantage. So I'll leave you both the floor. Thank you again very much. And um, yes, you have uh, about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you everyone for coming. First of all, it's a book. Uh, by uh, myself, Stella, but also Daniel Cardozo uh, from uh, University of Tonoman and Gigago um, from the University of Lausanne, they're both in the public. Uh, so we four uh, co-authors. Um, so we go on talking about politics and in this book, uh, we wanted really to understand when we were reading at these two narratives uh, of uh, lack of choice, lack of democracy. Uh, in, in the first picture, you saw it was a, a very nice a picture that were on the walls in Lisbon. Um, puppet, and, and we really wanted to understand, uh, is it really true? Is this narrative accurate? How did negotiations uh, take place when you have a bail bailout? what room of maneuver um, have bailout countries when, when this happened and what explain variation. And we were also wanted to look at what happens when the lenders leave town uh, after conditionality, what's happened? Are the reforms kept? If yet, to what extent? What is left? Uh, to what extent are minister willing and able to roll back changes imposed on them by international lenders? And the argument we make in this book um, is that, of course, bailout uh, countries are constrained. Of course, they only have a, a choice between options which are not very good, but as well, they have the possibility to some extent to cap capitalize on that constraint, uh, to, to, to make benefits out of it, some benefits out of it during the bailout and after the bailout. Uh, because, first of all, executives actually have some leverage during a bailout. That's something that uh, people who've been studying uh, the IMF know and have been theorizing. Uh, the, the lenders, when they come, uh, they need um, inside, inside this knowledge. They don't know very well how things work and they need their knowledge to understand which are the problems that should be solved. Uh, and they value ownership. So if the country is completely against any kind of reforms, it will resist it, the IMF knows that. Uh, so they want to pass reforms uh, that the member states want to pass. Uh, although uh, ownership is a little, uh, always a little bit uh, ambiguous, of course, because uh, if the member states want those reforms, uh, you wouldn't need a bailout to have those reforms. Um, so the, the argument we make, uh, which has been done before, is that actually uh, the bailout uh, allows the member states or the reformist uh, members of the member state uh, to push for reforms which had been on the agenda for some time and they couldn't have passed before. So we expect to find, because of this uh, leverage, because of this uh, opportunity, this window of opportunity to pass reforms which are then necessary, um, uh, evidence to, of capacity of bailout governments to define policies, to insert new measures, to, to resist the insertion of some measures, uh, or to resist the implementation of specific measures wanted by the lenders. We also accept, expect a partisanship effect, 
which is that it makes a difference, a difference who governs, which parties are elected. Elections do make a difference to some extent. Um, and we expect evidence of this capitalization of constraint, of this exploitation of external constraint to pass me measures which have been wanted by some minister for a long time. Even though it depends, of course, leverage depends on a series of, of variables which had been studied before, the saliency of an item, economic vulnerability of a giving country, the cost for creditors in case of non-bailout, and something which has been a little bit less theorized for the specific case of the bailout, the credibility of the bailout countries, uh, the trust um, that the lenders give to them, the capacity to implement the deals, the, the congruence of preferences, we say will make a difference and will allow member states to have more leverage. After bailout, uh, member states are pressured both to revert what has been done during conditionality um, and to keep them. Uh, to revert because it's the end of the bailout, some parties have been promising such reversals, but also you still have investors looking at what you do, you still have European rules, and if there were congruence between what you wanted and what the lenders seem to have imposed on you, uh, you don't want to revert everything. So we expect that the reversal will basically can be explained uh, if we look at the cost-benefit analysis. So governments will are likely to revert reforms when it's electorally paying, when it offers visible benefits for their constituency. Uh, and when they're not going to encounter opposition to reversals, um, and everyone would be happy if this reversal occur. But by contrast, they will keep all these reforms, mainly structural reforms, for example, um, in which you will have opposition uh, against reversals. So our methods here uh, has been very mostly qualitative, although we, we collected some data. Um, it's a process tracing of everything that happened. It's not a book that we could have written without being four co-authors because it in, involved more than 100 interviews for, for people who were negotiating. Um, a lot of triangulation of sources, official documents, press release, memoir. Uh, we also collect quantitative data. We identify the most important reforms in the memorandum, and we try to follow all they were during the bailout and after the bailout. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I think I'm, I'm continuing from here, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, and uh, to that point, to, to also thank uh, two of the research assistants of the project that are here in the audience, uh, Adam uh, Standring and Vivian Spiropoulou, which, uh, you know, because the work was immense to collect all this material, process tracing in five countries was more demanding than we thought. Uh, but to continue with the presentation, uh, so what do we find? We do find evidence of room of man manoeuvre in uh, different uh, formats we find that all five countries had the capacity to formulate policies by uh, giving their own uh, uh, ideas about what, what had to be done, especially when it goes to the structural reforms. So uh, they were inserting new policies in the memoranda by uh, using sometimes what was all there from uh, uh, international organizations and advice that they had in the past, or from what was there in the political parties manifestos that were in power at the moment uh, of the memoranda. At the same time, they had the capacity to, to resist the insertion of policies that they thought were very difficult uh, for them to implement. And they did that uh, uh, with various uh, ways, sometimes by uh, just not implementing. And I will come back to that in, 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 in a minute. So uh, this is exactly the, the next point, the capacity to resist implementation or to partially implement. So although sometimes they were accepting some uh, ideas to go in the, in the programs, uh, they, they already knew that they were not going to implement that. Uh, a good example here is uh, uh, Cyprus that had a, a plan for private, privatization in the memorandum, but both the lenders and the, and the borrowers knew that it was only a plan and the plan for discussion that was not going to be implemented. And finally, they had the capacity to revert both uh, within the period of implementation of the memoranda, but also later. Uh, so what we find is that uh, because of all this uh, capacity um, to formulate, the MOUs in the five countries and the conditionality varied between the bailout countries 
And it's not what we expect, this one size fits all uh, that we know from the literature. The next one. Thanks. So this is just to show you a little bit some numbers of the reforms that were implemented uh, in, 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 the, in the countries. And what we are uh, um, measuring here is which reforms were uh, at least partially uh, uh, implemented. We did that by uh, creating a database uh, of all the reforms that were included in all the memoranda of all the five countries. And we see that the, the numbers are really uh, high. So in reality, although all these countries were in the misery corner, as Stephanie very well uh, put it, they actually did implement 94% uh, for Ireland, 74 for Portugal, I will explain that later, 93 uh, for Spain, 85 uh, for Greece, etc., etc. The next one, please. So uh, we find this evidence of crisis exploitation in all countries, and I just uh, wanted to uh, give you some uh, examples here. Uh, so, for example, in Portugal, uh, the government already wanted to do something about the excessive profit in the pharmaceutical and ener energy industry. So this was included in the, in the memorandum. Pension reform was something that Greece was struggling with for many, many years. So all three governments, independently of uh, partisanship, uh, tried to do something about it. And slowly, after three memoranda, we did see a reform. The same with property tax in Ireland or the liberalization of professions in Spain. Uh, what we then tried to understand was uh, what, uh, on what bargaining leverage depends on. And we, we, what we found was uh, that first and most important, importantly is the silence of the issue. So issues such as the macroeconomics uh, uh, wouldn't be negotiated. So the economic fundamentals wouldn't be negotiated. Austerity wouldn't be negotiated. What the member states could do uh, was to negotiate the structural reforms that would follow uh, the austerity, the cuts. Uh, then we also found out that the capacity to implement the deals increased the credibility of the country. So when countries were able to implement, then they had more leverage to choose what uh, uh, they would do with the next phase of the implementation. Um, also, another important point was the cost for the lenders in case of non-deal, and, and I think uh, uh, Stephanie touched upon that in, in her presentation, were also important. So if the whole Eurozone was uh, going to be affected, uh, the countries had a bit more leverage. So in 2012, Greece had a bit more leverage, but this didn't last. Um, and finally, uh, uh, the knowledge about the country gave them uh, the leverage. So the fact that they knew what uh, would work uh, gave them this uh, uh, possibility to bargain. So now to go a little bit to the reversals and the resilience of the conditionality. This is something that uh, we thought there hasn't been so much work done uh, uh, upon, so we, we, we really try to focus that. And we found that uh, we saw reformulation and reversions during the bailout since um, the countries were getting their funding in trances. Uh, uh, they had the opportunity to renegotiate the details of some of the structural reforms uh, over time. Uh, in Greece, we also had the chance to see what happens when there are more than one bailout and how different governments tried uh, to change what was there from one memorandum to the other. Not much change uh, in reality, but some reversals were there. Um, so we also found uh, exactly that when a, a government changed, uh, there was this partisanship effect that gave it uh, the leverage to at least uh, uh, renegotiate and reverse a few things when they started with a new term. Um, but in a way, we, we also found out that reversals are the result of a cost benefit analysis from the side of the government. So they wouldn't try to do a reversal if this was going to be very costly, and they would only do it if this was going to really benefit, uh, uh, benefit them in the next electoral cycle. And uh, finally, what we can really say from the data, and I think there is a next table uh, showing that, is that structural reforms are most likely uh, to, to stay. So we didn't see reversals, didn't really uh, concern the structural reforms, but mainly the cost-cutting exercise uh, that countries had to do and that they were really affecting uh, their relationship with the citizens, they're affecting their services. And this is, uh, this is a table just showing uh, that. Yes, 
So to conclude, because I think it would be important to, to leave some time for discussion, um, we, we, we argue that executives are capable of extracting policy benefits from the bailout during and after the process, even in, in the worst uh, situation, even in the case of Greece, I would say, uh, for, for, for colleagues that uh, always uh, think that Greece is, is, a, is a country with the least uh, options, uh, or at least was during the Eurozone uh, crisis. Uh, so we do find evidence of room of maneuver and crisis exploitation. We try to put bargaining context uh, in, into, take bargaining context into account and show why it is important. We find out that partisanship is only uh, partially important. So in reality, no matter what kind of government we had, the changes were not so substantial. Uh, at least not during uh, the, the implementation phase. Uh, it was easier for, for uh, uh, governments to change things after, after the, the end of the memoranda, but the partisanship didn't seem to be as important as we thought at the beginning. And finally, that it's possible to gain cre credit for electorally rewarding reversals. So in a way, uh, uh, the executives kept on uh, um, capitalizing uh, on uh, the constraint of the previous uh, years by showing that they can change things even uh, after uh, the bailout has fin had finished. So I think this is it for now and we can continue in the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Catherine, for sharing the slides. Thank you very much, Catherine uh, and Stella. Um, I think the floor is now uh, open to our, for our discussion, but I just would like to remind the audience that you can already prepare your questions and post them in the chat. Uh, I will first give the floor to Matthias Matais. Thanks for joining us. And um, yes, please let us know what you think about these two excellent books. books. Thank you, uh, Sarah, and I, a word of thanks from me to uh, the panelists and, and the whole audience for that matter, because due to my travels to California at the last minute, we've moved this panel three hours um, later, right? Otherwise, I would have had to wake up at 5 a.m., so, so thanks to, to everybody. Um, I, I only have, have good, good things to say, actually. Uh, it was a real pleasure to, to have read both books. It's, it's actually quite a privilege to be able to discuss some of their key uh, insights and, and strengths today. And so thank you to the authors uh, for, for the invitation. And um, I, I like to start by saying that if there is ever an event that shows the, the um, utility and the, the strengths of book publishing, this is it. Because I think as some of the authors already pointed out, it, it's impossible to do this in an article length uh, piece. Um, it's also quite impossible to do this on your own. I mean, maybe Stephanie Walter could do this on her own. I'm, I'm not sure given her recent rate of productivity, but um, it, it, it's where, why we do books, why us political scientists still stick by books. And, and we don't have to bury all the nuance and all the stuff in an appendix somewhere buried online on an article's uh, website, right? And so um, that's, that's the first thing I think that, that came out uh, very, very clearly It's just, uh, how much, how much detail, how much empirical rigor uh, that that both books kind of uh, bring bring about. So they have um, they they mar both books marshal an amazing amount of new data, which I think is why many scholars will like it. Right? Whether they are survey data uh, or interview data, which uh, shed light on some of uh, of the difficulties, the opportunities, but I think especially the nuances of of bailout politics um, in in the EU. For anyone like myself, and I'm, I was grateful for this um, because these are not the kind of books that I that I would I would approach and, and write myself right away. Um, because I I think as as the authors of the books know, I, I tend to believe that the northern creditor countries actually faced very little constraint in their choices of how to get out of the debt crisis, while the southern debtor countries were massively constrained. And so I, I have to kind of rethink some of this. Right? I have to kind of think again about how I think about the politics, bailout politics in the North versus the South internal, as well as at the, at the EU level. But you know, be careful. That doesn't mean that I have fundamentally changed my mind and, and I'll explain why um, in, a, in a minute. So let me turn to the, the Walter Ray Redeker book uh, first. It, it, again, to, to my knowledge, this is the first major book that puts the Eurozone crisis in a comparative perspective, looking at other balance of payments crises, and it treats the politics of adjustment uh, 
uh, in both deficit or periphery countries and surplus core countries um, equally. And this, I, I cannot stress this enough, is, is incredibly helpful uh, for someone like myself who had to explain the Euro crisis ad nauseum to my macroeconomics colleagues on the same floor in DC, many of them who studied Latin America, they just didn't understand, right? They, they didn't understand why Europe chose a particular I guess misery corner, as, as Stephanie uh, called it so so beautifully, and 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 for them, they just saw this as yet another balance of payments crisis, and we're we're really kind of puzzled uh, about how how the answers and the solutions were were put into place. And I think this book does does a kind of masterful job in in putting that uh, in in perspective. So the the main strength of of the book is is the open uh, economy politics lens, right, where it, it analyzes the euro crisis from the point of view of interest groups, calculations, and voters' interests and in taking into account the costs and benefits of the politics of adjustment and how it then structures these choices around external exchange rate devaluation, revaluation, eurozone breakup, internal demand stimulus versus austerity and structural reform. And then of course, debt financing options for um, adjustments. These choices are key, right? And they influence different groups uh, differently and create winners and losers. But in Europe, of course, everyone <laughs> ended up in the misery corner, right? Kind of giving uh, extra evidence to this idea that the eurozone for the last 10 years has been a rather unhappy uh, marriage right or what what often other observers call hotel california where you can check in anytime you want but you can never leave the costs are simply too high so the argument which is entirely plausible and very convincing the way it's been structured in the book is that these preferences then shape government choices and economic policy uh, outcomes and so when you read this book, you'll get a tremendous amount of new original survey data, representative interest groups of both surplus countries focused on Germany, Austria, and the Netherlands, which actually the choice of Austria and the Netherlands is great because they are now the, the two biggest members of the frugal four or frugal five, uh, and the deficit countries, Greece, Spain, and Ireland, which gives you a nice sample of, of different situations. Um, wealth of existing scholarship on the political economy uh, of, of the Eurozone is, is also used. So, what, you, what I found is that these original data sets um, will be a big hit among researchers because they will, they will I think they are available already uh, online. And the authors uh, have also been careful to corroborate their survey data with in-depth and, and semi-structured interviews with key actors in their story, which increases only the robustness of, of, of their, their findings. And so given that I think Stephanie uh, wrote this uh, with, with, with Two co-authors that were postdocs as part of the same research grant. I mean, this is, I can't think of a better use of human resources, division of labor, comparative advantage, and, and all that. Also, what I found is that uh, when you read the book, the, there's no difference in quality between chapters. And I can only imagine there was there was a real division of labor there uh, between the, the, the co-authors. So that 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 also speaks to the to the strengths of the book. So let me ask the authors two big questions uh, that they can think about um, during during the, the, the discussion. So what were the main lessons learned, if any, by political leaders when it comes to the politics of adjustment, right? Because I completely agree from very early on uh, and, and other, other IPE theorists in the US like Jeff Fried and Mark Koplovich are on the, the exact same line of this. You know, why was the burden of adjustment completely pushed onto the countries that needed help uh, the most? If a new debt crisis comes along after the pandemic ends, which many people are now speculating about, are, are we likely to make the same mistakes? Or are the shifts uh, in monetary policy in the last decade too important to go back to politics as usual? In other words, is the threat that hung over the Eurozone, and especially in the early period of the crisis, will that be, will that be gone? And then second question is, uh, and that's directly for Stephanie, is do you think preferences have changed since the euro crisis when it comes to dealing with these kind of systemic crises as we've to some extent already seen right in the response to the the pandemic in other words have electorates and their political leaders become more open to systemic solutions like a euro bond right like an economic government like a kind of fiscal capacity or was it the decision made by eu leaders in the summer of 2020 instrumental in changing preferences or not. So back to the question I always ask Stephanie, is it preferences of voters that shaped how politicians act or is it politicians views and ideas, my bias, right? That then uh, lets, lets electorates kind of slowly update or, or their, um, their preferences. Uh, 
Let me turn to the, um, um, the, the, the Maori, Ladi, Cardoso, and, and, and Gago book, Capitalizing on Constraint, Bailout Politics in Eurozone Countries. I, 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 so this, this book I read very recently in the, in the last few weeks, and, and, and it's, it's great because you can kind of read a chapter at, at the time uh, without losing the general uh, gist, gist of it, because in the end, I mean, they're, they're dealing the five key empirical chapters of the five bailout countries. Uh, chronologically, right? So basically from Greece uh, in 2010, of course, multiple bailouts there uh, to, to Cyprus in 2013. And I, I greatly enjoyed it because I, there's just so much empirical detail about these countries that I didn't know, right? And so it's exactly the kind of book someone who loves the politics of the Eurozone crisis will, will love. And there's a lot of politics uh, in, in, this, in this book. So the main argument is that the experience of the five bailout countries during the Euro crisis was first of all, very different from one another. And secondly, that the bailout countries had quite a bit of leeway and discretion in shaping the terms of the bailouts, even though that was more uh, the case when it came to structural reforms uh, than it was uh, for fiscal austerity. It also gives us someone like Randy Henning will love this book because it, it gives you a, another lens into the dynamics within the Troika of, of the European Commission, the IMF and, and the ECB. The theoretical framework serves to inform the cases. It does so in an admirable fashion. So any PhD students watching, this is, this is the way to do it, right? It's, if you have a theory, it has to inform your cases. It doesn't have to be two completely separate uh, accounts. And, and the book's propositions are woven quite beautifully uh, throughout uh, the narrative. The cases from Greece to Cyprus, Ireland to, to Portugal and Spain give the reader an incredibly rich understanding of the intricacies of the bailouts in different countries, but clearly and clearly it was domestic politics driving the outcomes as much as it was the what you could call the diktat from Brussels, Frankfurt and, and, and Washington. Over and over again, the author stressed that the bailout countries had quite a bit more leverage than has often been understood. Right? And so some of this I have to rethink and this book is therefore a great addition to the sprawling field of the politics of the Eurozone and the lessons we can learn from its past decade of uh, crises. I think it, for me, its core strength is its careful theoretical propositions and the careful detail with which the empirical material is presented to uh, the reader. So I've, I've read it on my iPad, but I look forward to adding a hard copy to my growing collection on Eurozone books. I had to clear yet another shelf uh, for this. So let me also ask, the authors um, two, uh, two broad questions. The first question, and that's the main question I had throughout reading the book, and I imagine other readers will have this too, so I don't think I'm really the only one, but is, does it really matter that the bailout countries could choose their own poison, as it were, right? So, I mean, austerity, that's given, they couldn't even touch this, but so they could then, you know, reform a little bit more on pensions, um, but do less on, let's say, the labor market or something like this. So isn't the bigger story not that the solution to the crisis in all countries were in the end varieties of fiscal austerity and structural reform? Yes, the book explains why these varieties uh, played out, but surely the individual member states could avoid the most sensitive reforms and implement some of the more preferred options, but the broad direction of the solution to the crisis was to, in the end, blame the periphery. I mean, rather for 100% of the crisis, right? Rather than uh, the core, which is something the politics of, of bad options, of course, shows very clearly. And that leads me to my uh, second question, is how will the future politics of austerity and uh, structural adjustment play out in the bailout countries, now that it has become clear who the winners and the losers were? There's been a major political realignment in all bailout countries. Some, uh, the work of Jonathan Hopkins shows this very well for Southern Europe, right? So there's well-established patterns of left-right politics in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, et cetera, that have completely been destroyed by the Eurozone crisis. So my question to the authors is, based on your very detailed knowledge of these cases, what will replace them, right? Will we return to the same patterns uh, of left-right politics with transformed parties? or new parties, or will we see a similar fragmentation of political parties and the difficult coalition that follows like we've actually seen in the North now? I mean, you think of the Netherlands as a very good example of this, where there's now 14 parties in parliament and, and, and a very hard uh, coalition negotiation um, ahead. But let me end by thanking uh, 
for the everyone for the invitation and i look forward to the discussion thank you very much um these are really important questions but i would like also to give a chance to paul to uh, give his insights on the two books and then we will have a response from from the authors and then we keep time for the audience so paul you have uh, the floor great thanks so much sarah and and thanks uh everybody and and matthias i mean i i echo everything that um matthias said in in terms of what are two empirically rich books um and I wrote down in front of me, they are forensic. I mean, the level of detail and analysis here is, is, is phenomenal um, and thoroughly enjoyable on, on sort of both counts. Um, they, they are excellent reads. They're empirically rich and contribute originally to the, to the debate. And, and, and they, um, they were great reads, ab absolutely. Um, and I, I think you know, it's hard to believe that this happened over 10 years ago and we're still experiencing the, the uh, sort of consequences of it. And I just want to pick, have sort of a question for each of the authors and then I'd like us to think a bit further ahead about the future. Um, if, if we can stretch our brains that far, it seems so sort of crazy, everything that's um, been going on. Um, I've just come to Stephanie's book first and what I really loved about this were the sort of the alternatives or lack of um, and, and I remember when the, the teaching the Eurozone crisis to postgraduate students and trying to get them to think about what is the, what are the alternatives and how would they be possible and that's a really difficult thing to, to do right and, and this book fills that gap sort of perfectly and, and tells you why certain decisions were, were not taken and why others were. Um, Misery Corner doesn't seem to be a particularly great place to be. It, it does what it says on the tin, right? Um, but I guess what's interesting about the Eurozone crisis is that they were in Misery Corner, but they were also members of a single currency. Um, and that's what makes it really unique and then gets you sort of thinking about these particular alternatives. And a question there, I think, to think about is that if, if they had their own currencies, do we assume that, that at some point they would have still ended up in misery corner, given the nature of their economies, consumer driven demand rather than sort of export led? And if they were in misery corner, would they have got there sooner? Would the crisis have been less severe? Like, I think that the, that's a really, that's a question that's fascinating. There's not necessarily an, an obvious answer to it, but maybe given the depth of your historical um, and comparative analysis, you, you'd have a sense of what that sort of alternative um, could, could be. Um, so that that really sort of got me thinking there and, and, and scratching my head and, and, and I'd be interested to hear what you, you had to say. My question for um, Catherine and Stella is pretty similar to, to that um, of Matthias, who, who said, you know, the sort of what so question really, which is that um, you call it sort of maneuvering, room to maneuver, you know, countries accept bailouts and, and, and aid and they have some um, flexibility or wiggle room as I, I called it in, in my head to to change some of that austerity that that's coming and I think a question that is is important is is to what extent does that make a difference the the, the medicine has still been taken um, and and how significant then is is that um, medicine for the for the patient and and does the wiggle room make a real difference to to certain groups of, of individuals um and 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 so those are sort of my two questions to to the um both sets of authors i think they're sort of super fascinating books and and lead you um to some really interesting thought processes but importantly fill gaps in their respective fields and then after sort of reading those books, I dared to think about the future and what that might be like. Um, and I, I was sort of thinking two things really, whether austerity can ever really be justified and whether history will repeat itself. Those are sort of two interesting things that we need to think about. Um, 
and and I think you know there is a sort of inherent contradiction in austerity and I personally don't think it's justified um and and that reason being that you know neoliberalism is built on a model whereby the no market knows best it spreads risk and investors take risks and governments remove themselves um, from major decisions and allow markets to fail but that's the sort of theory of neoliberalism, right? But the practice is really different. The Eurozone crisis demonstrates the complexity of financial markets. Um, they're intertwining with the state and, and this idea that they are too big to fail. And for that reason, the market has the upper hand, right? Financial markets have the upper hand. Um, they can take risks and they can bail, get bailout and they will be protected. And governments have essentially lost sovereignty um, over the post-war period to financial markets. And we also need to acknowledge that austerity is driven not just by the EU or the IMF, that's only half of the story, it's also driven by financial private sector actors um, who are seemingly unaccountable. Um, and then that sort of leads me then to a, um, an interesting second question, will history repeat itself? And, and this is something, I mean, in, in particular, Stella's uh, and Catherine's book touches on towards the, the end. Um, the Eurozone crisis was a differentiated process, both in terms of timings, but also the extent to which Eurozone members were affected and why that crisis happened in a particular member state. And that differentiated process over time and the causes behind it um, created countless windows of opportunity um, but they were small and windows of opportunity for things to change, but they were very small, very fleeting. And, you know, it, it was a domino effect of one member state to, to the next. Um, COVID is different. COVID's really different, right? On, on the one hand, it's affected all member states the same. There have been lockdowns and a combined vaccination program. The economic shock is significant. Um, Interestingly, it's external to the EU, just like the US um, financial crisis. And, it, and it, it appears that this could be sort of fertile ground for a collective response that shifts integration in, in the shared currency or single currency to a more shared sense of equal um, responsibility. And the financial markets at the moment are very quiet and, and speculation about the future and how they will react to high, what are quite astronomically high levels of national debt. Um, you know, we're in a sort of the calm before the storm. Um, so while COVID is external to the EU, um, what we can say, but, but it's exposed all member states to similar sort of forces, it is likely to hit member states economically, some more severe than others. And, and there could still be a differentiated response like there was during the Eurozone crisis. COVID could unfold just like the Eurozone crisis did, um, but it may not, right? We, we can't sort of sit here and predict um, doom and gloom. Um, the important thing I think to think about is that over that last decade, the power relationship between states and financial markets hasn't really changed. And the only way that that will really change is the shared sense of collective responsibility in the Eurozone. Um, so we, we could get there over the next few years, but um, you know, given Northern European positions and sometimes the hardening of those in the context of the frugal four, I think it remains a sort of open question. Um, so, I can't sort of come down either side on, on where we're going in the future. You can see these similarities in, in the Eurozone crisis with what may be about to come in the future, but there are also some subtle nuances and differences as well. And sometimes that can sort of create change. Um, so, so two sort of really fascinating books that lead you to some questions, but also I think lead us to future research agendas. Um, and I look forward to what all of the authors have to say about the impact of COVID and the Eurozone in, in, in the years to come. 
but thoroughly enjoyable reads. It's been a super privilege to read them and, and also hear what you have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I see that time is running. Can I ask the authors to maybe go in the order? Stephanie is going to start uh, maybe five minutes max, really, on, on the comments and the questions. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to be short. Thank you so much, uh, Matthias and Paul, for these excellent comments and for being so uh, so nice about the book. It's, it's great to hear. Um, and of course, I could not have done this alone. And uh, Niels and Ari really, really did a lot of the work, especially in the empirical work. Uh, so, so really, I, I want to give them credit for that. Uh, I think um, you both raised really interesting questions. And of course, I also connected. So let me try to sort of um, uh, answer, at least give you my thoughts. I, I think like answering some of these questions is really hard. Um, so in terms of the main lessons learned, I, I mean, I think there have been some reforms and people coming from like economics and also perhaps the IPE side, you know, point out like that these reforms were not enough. The interesting thing is that oftentimes European scholars or Europe scholars think that there were actually quite substantial reforms given what you know what's possible so i mean i think we it's both right it was a lot for europe but it was probably not enough so i think we are perhaps in a better state now than we were 10 years ago but it's not great yet so you know we'll see um i think what has also changed is that especially for example the german surplus has increasingly reoriented it, it itself away from european countries and more towards non-european countries that could sort of reduce the interdependence, but whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in the crisis is, is not clear to me uh, a priori. Um, I mean, I think sort of, um, I think that the next generation EU, like the, the question of, of sort of the COVID crisis has this changed something. I think this is a really interesting question and, and chimes also with Matthias' question then on sort of do have preferences changed, right? So, I mean, I think my, my personal reading is, um, like why was it possible to create a next generation EU scheme, but it wasn't possible to do this in the year crisis, is that when it was first discussed, the distributive consequences of COVID were much less clear than in the euro crisis. In the euro crisis, it was clear if we give money, these are the countries that get it, and these are the countries who have to pay. And in the corona crisis, in the COVID crisis, I mean, first it seemed like, oh, it's Italy and Spain again. And but then suddenly, you know, so you're, oh, but these countries are having from these countries are also having. And then also you realize, oh, okay, so some countries are doing well now, but then, you know, three months later, they're actually doing well. And so, so I think there was much more of a veil of ignorance about the distributive consequences of this. And I think that enabled the whole program. But I think it's also really interesting because I think it creates a precedent because actually, I mean, for the first time, we do have something that like a Eurobond, right? So some, so, so that I think could really change the way that crises are um, approached in the future. I think a lot will also depend on how it will now play out. Markets reacted favorably. So I think that was already like a good thing, I think, for, for, for people supporting more redistribution. Um, it will also, I think, depend on how, how like the whole program uh, um, rolls out. But so I, I really think sort of the original hurdle of two clear distributive consequences that that was easier in COVID and that may actually in the long run prove like a positive thing for the EU that actually made some things possible. The other thing, of course, that has changed is that there's much more Euroscepticism in Europe and the EU is under much more pressure to prove itself. But that could also go both ways, right? On the, on the one hand, it could really strengthen reluctance to actually transfer money. On the other hand, it might actually sort of at some point lead people to think we need to really, we actually need to save this EU, otherwise it's going to crumble. So here, again, I, I'm not sure how eventually it will play out, but I think these are really interesting developments that make the current crisis slightly different from, uh, from what it used to look like. So um, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I think these questions are really, those are really the key questions that, that will determine a lot on how these things will play out. And I think, so in that sense, I think COVID will reverberate further, but I, I think it will, if you think about critical junctures, I do think that that may really have been one. So thanks a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll be curious to hear what Stella and, and Catherine thinks about these, these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thank you for, for the discussions for the very friendly reading of the books. I hope uh, this will also be the case for the rest of the uh, audience. Um, so I want to ask, answer the question about why does it matter that there was this uh, leeway? Uh, I think this was a real uh, 
because we think it matters, this is why we did the book. And why am I saying that? I think most of the literature coming from political economy was focusing on the bads of the European Union, which are all correct and true. And this is what we are discussing now also for the recovery and resilience uh, uh, facility and how it will play out. But what we hadn't really looked at, and this is what we wanted to do, was what happens at the domestic level. And what happens at the domestic level is that these uh, uh, MOUs, these economic adjustment programs, were not only about austerity. A very big uh, part of them was just about changes and reforms that needed to be done. Cyprus ended up with a, a, an NHS, a national health system that didn't have before. Uh, Greece ended up with a pension system that is fair for future gen generations, or at least is moving towards a pension system that is fair for future generations. So this is not about austerity. And it does matter to remember that and to write about it. So I think uh, we would, uh, from your questions, I understand that we need a to write an extra article, putting these arguments a bit uh, more strongly uh, forward. Um, for the political uh, system and how it has changed in the countries, um, I think Catherine will say a bit more about it, but uh, uh, my feeling is that uh, parties did change, but this division between left and right did not completely uh, disappear. Maybe it uh, reframed itself like uh, pro-memorandum against memorandum, pro-EU against EU, but at the end of the day, uh, the parties changed, some of the actors changed, but the, the division between left and, and right uh, is still uh, there. And just a few words for the um, uh, Next Generation uh, program and the RRF, because I'm working on it with other colleagues and with Sarah uh, for a paper that we are uh, jointly writing uh, now. Um, I think that the, the, what, we, what we saw was that the discourse of moral hazard just died. And I think Matthias knows very well about this discourse of moral hazard from his writings. Um, it was impossible, and that Stephanie said, it was impossible um, to blame uh, the periphery this time. So this is, this is uh, big. Um, and I wouldn't say that there are subtle nuances, as Paul said, in what we see now. I think uh, what we saw in the summer and the fact that all parliaments actually yesterday finished approving uh, the borrowing, uh, the commission being able to do that, uh, it's historic. So I, I think I'm um, optimistic that we're seeing a new phase. This doesn't mean that we cannot... Uh, that we won't go back uh, to, to past mistakes, but at least we do see some movement. And this is also due to learning, learning from past mistakes and uh, similar actors being uh, in the same uh, position. So Lagarde, Merkel, you know, they don't want to be uh, blamed for the end of Europe. So I will stop here because I want to leave some time for Catherine also. Thanks. I'd be super quick, huh? uh, but thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias and Paul, for not reading one book, but two books, uh, a long book, um, complex book. So thank you so much. And for there is a lot of things that make me thinking, but I don't want to take too much time. And perhaps just two, just two points um, about, about the markets and how they limit um, room of maneuver and what it implies for left and right. Um, we have a very good example with Portugal. We was um, socialist government passed explicitly supported by radical left parties. And how do they deal with that? But what being in the left means when you have the market watching what you do. Uh, and they've been very, very successful because they've been elected again and what they've been doing uh, it's something I call in a, in a other article austerity by stealth. So they try, they still pursue some austerity, uh, but with more visible reversals. And, and we discussed that in the book as well. So I think there is this constraint that limits to the, the scope of choice. And, and as you say, Paul, it's not only the European rules, it's really the markets. And when you talk with ministers, they will tell you, look, we are leftist party. Look how much we can save if we decrease the interest rates. Uh, and to decrease interest rates, you have to do some cutting or and so it's a very difficult uh, trade-off. But if, if the market is happy and you have more money for education and health as well. So this left-right have to take into account the savings you can make when decreasing interest rates. Uh, and about the COVID and how it compares, 
thing I, I would just wanted as Stella said it was a lot of learning you know, the European Commission which was the institution pushing for austerity not so much the IMF learned that austerity quick austerity is not might not be the solution European Central Bank thanks God learned uh, a lot as well uh, and and I guess I hope they will learn that pushing uh, against the wish of the member state result in member state blocking reforms and that you need to value ownership. Okay, thank you very much. So we have questions coming in uh, mostly from uh, colleagues. The first one from uh, Valtro Shekel. She's asking how the authors see each other's work. So how do you uh, uh, yeah, reflect on, on the other book? And we have a question from Jonathan uh, Zaitlin. Um, question for Stephanie Walter, but also perhaps for Matthias, actually, um, in explaining the difference between the response to the COVID and Euro crisis, the key development was arguably the shift in Germany's position. That's a long question, <laughs> a comment and a question. I'm not sure that this had to do with a veil of ignorance, but rather with concern for a possible breakdown of the internal market as expressed amongst other by Angela Merkel and German business organizations. Secondly, there also seems to have been some shifts in economic thinking, if we think about the German political elite, especially around Schultz, which could already be seen before the crisis in relation to proposals for completion of the banking union and the appointment of someone like Isabel Schabel to the ECB. So the question is, uh, would you agree? Um, and I think just um, Valtrod also um, specified her questions in terms of uh, seeing each other books and in particular in regard to the diversity of countries and political agency of program countries as well. So I'm not sure who feels comfortable uh, going first. I see Matthias is nodding. Would you, would you like to have a first uh, reaction? Not so really, just... Sarah. I mean, it, this, this, it's not my birthday and I'm not the birthday boy today, but I, I'll be very brief and I'm already happy Walter doesn't have a question for me. So I um, will respond to Jonathan Zeitlin um, very briefly by saying I do agree with him, right? I mean, in a recent piece I have in RIPE on leadership and hegemonic stability, I actually had to insert that at the end because it shows very much that there is a change in thinking in the finance ministry around Schultz of Germany, not just as the implementer of the rules, but more as kind of, you know, providing regional public goods and so on and playing, playing its part. And I absolutely agree that it's hard to see next generation EU come together without the German shift on Eurobonds. And I would secondly add, just especially for Sarah, if the UK had still been in the EU. And so there was very fortunate timing there with the UK actually leaving the political institutions on January 31. And then I think Merkel decided very much because COVID was a different crisis. It didn't was it wasn't easy to shift blame in this crisis, right? I mean, it hit it hit people's lives literally. And 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 I think there, she single handedly showed that you know Germany was actually the quite reasonable northern uh, European country compared to the frugal five or or four. But anyway, I'll I'll give the floor back to the authors. It's it's their party. Uh, I, I think I agree with Matthias. I mean, uh, I think the, the German shift was really important. But I, I also, I do think that the Euro crisis also played a role. I think if the Euro crisis had not been you know, managed the way it had, I'm not sure that the Germans would have been so willing to shift in the face of COVID. So I, I think there was also some learning going on. And I mean, there has been a lot of discussion in also in Germany over time. I mean, the criticism of this very frugal, whatever, you know, non-adjustment uh, policy in Germany had been growing and sort of of this very ideological uh, Schäuble style uh, approach. There has been a lot of debate. And, and also it's interesting, I mean, if you follow the German Twitter debate, for example, like younger uh, economists um, that, that are trained outside of Germany also uh, have, have come up and, and they've been much more sort of also I mean, accustomed with like the, the, the US approach and then discussions and so on. And I think that has really changed some of the discussion in, in Germany. And I think within that setting, it, you know, that happened. But I still think that, you know, I mean, I think if the blame, if sort of it would have been, so if there would have been like a narrative, a strong narrative again in, in the in the country, well, they they brought it on themselves, you know, like we all we all close to airports, but Italy let them open, something like that. If something like that had happened, I think that would have been then 
you know, uh, then the, the Northern Saints would have come out again. Uh, and I think it was easier to, 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 to play it that way. Uh, let me say something on, on, um, on Catherine and, and Stella's uh, book, because um, I, I think, I mean, what I liked about the book is, I think, like, I, what I liked about putting the two books together is I, that I think those are really great compliments, right? I think sort of, um, I think our book is sort of the, the, the more general picture, and then your book zooms into what actually happened in uh, in the crisis countries, and then also what really happened in terms of policy. We look more at preferences, and you really very in very much detail then look at what really went on and, and who did what and when, and and so I think that's really nice. Um, I think they also, I mean, I, I think they they find they're very compatible in a sense. For example, you find that partisanship is not that it's important. We find the same thing, and so on. So I think in that sense, I think they're they're really compatible. But what I really like, and here's sort of my IPE head on and sort of this, uh, this mission that I had with, so I'm not surprised that Mark Koplovich and Jeff Frieden have similar opinions than I have because we've talked about the crisis so much and we published a special issue that tried to sort of put out a, an IPE perspective on, on the crisis. And I think that's really important. And your book shows that because I think your book is a great um, application of all this literature on the IMF and all this research that shows how much agency countries have even in IMF programs and how much politics there is in these in these programs. It's not at all a technocratic decision. And I think your, your book really masterfully shows that that also happened in the Euro crisis. And I think that that's what I really liked about it. And, and you cite all this literature and so on and, and you apply it so nicely to the European case. And I thought that was really great. Um, what I also thought was really interesting also in the context of the IMF and I haven't really seen research on this in the IMF context, so I'm actually now thinking that your book can also really be insightful for the IMF literature, is this focus on reversals. I thought that was really interesting and sort of who reverses, which reforms are reversed. I'm not so surprised that structural reforms do not get re re um, reversed so much because once you've done the reforms, then also structural power of these, these players goes down and so on. So, But I think that, that really is very there's a lot of inspiration to be had from your book for, for the whole IMF literature too. And, and that's what I really liked about your book. Thank you very much. Um, Stella and Catherine, I'm sure you have also a reaction, but I also see we have an additional question in the Q&A. So I will try to bring this person to ask the question if I manage. Um, um, so it's Angelos Angelou. If it works, otherwise I will just uh, read uh, the question. So the question is as follows, um, is the non-reversal of structural reforms evidence of some kind of ideological change in the bailout countries? I think it's been partially answered and or simply a matter of reaping the benefits of initially painful reforms. I think that's really also for Stella and Catherine if you would like to take both questions. Should, should I start, Stella, or you want to start? You start. Um, so perhaps I, I, I start with the, the question about reversals, which is a little bit easier. It's both. Um, the first thing that uh, uh, Rajoy or Pasos Coelho did when the Troika left was to revert some of, of the policies. Uh, cuts, uh, pension cuts, uh, civil servant cuts, and the lenders were, were very unhappy. Uh, so the risk is cost benefit analysis, uh, regardless of ideology. But of course, when you campaign about reversal, about uh, turning the page to austerity, then you, you had more uh, when, when uh, a, left, a leftist uh, party was, was elected. About, uh, about what I think, thought about uh, Stephanie and how it, it inspired me. So just, I wanted to do this book um, presentation with you, Stephanie, because I, I, I'm really a fan and I really, uh, enjoy your work and I really in that book what I learned and uh, I wish I did more in mine is really looking at the, the strength of um, interest groups. So in the book we take a little bit government preference from granted and we don't try to explain where, where they come from and that's something that in another book discussion we uh, they told us is that government preference call come very much as well of what they think is good to do for the country but as well and, and they want to bypass interest groups, but sometimes they cannot. And you have a game there, and which make that government choose um, uh, the path of 
least resistance as well in defining what they when they're going to fight, depending on what interest group you want. And that's something that I find very, very useful to show or what interest group wants determines uh, government's preferences. Yes, just, just a word. Um, it's exactly, I think, the same uh, thought uh, of complementarity between the two books, uh, um, because uh, in a way we focus much more uh, on the elites and how the elites uh, action upon the preferences. So we could really uh, learn from your database and maybe develop a little bit uh, the argument further by understanding a little bit what um, makes the elites <laughs> move. Uh, so it's also, I think it's an excellent uh, academic practice that you, you have this database uh, available uh, to, to, for, for other researchers to use. And I think uh, uh, Catherine, uh, I and the, the rest of the authors should probably do the same with our database of the reforms uh, uh, because it took us a long time to, 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 to put it together and we haven't used it as much as we would uh, have liked. So in a way, uh, you know, we can, I think, use each other's materials to go a little bit more in depth and to challenge some, some, some ideas that are there for granted in, in the literature. So I don't, I don't think I need to, to reply anything else. I think we have covered most of it uh, for now. Yes. So I think we've we've gone through, we've covered a lot of ground. But uh, if I may uh, abuse my position of chair, I was wondering um, if, if both uh, uh, so the authors could also reflect on how because one. Um, uh, Stephanie's book is a lot about the bargaining and the negotiations and and what options were chosen then we have the domestic impact to what extent your research is it actually what are, what is it telling us about the governance of the European Union and also is it do, can you draw some lessons as to any changes or any main lessons for governance decision making EU institutions as well um from your studies and, and for the future thank you do you want me to go ahead or do you, do you guys want to go ahead as you wish uh, stephanie if you want to think about this i, I mean i think it's a good question I, I need to perhaps also think about this a bit further i mean i think one of the things that made crisis resolution difficult was that the moment a crisis hit it became very apparent that there was no clearly established European resolution mechanism, right? So this became very intergovernmental, right? It basically became like an international bargaining thing with individual countries. And there was nothing sort of institutionalized where you think about beforehand, once we have a crisis, like, like a dispute settlement mechanism kind of thing where you think in good times about if we have a problem, how are we gonna approach it, right? So it was very ad hoc and very intergovernmental, which then also, of course, gave national interests much more, much more leeway and much more weight, and and also politicized the issues at home, not not just on the European level, but also at home much more, which then also limited, I think, government's room to maneuver. But I think that made it really difficult. And I think so. In, in that sense, I think some of the reforms have been good to to a sort of reduce the risks. But also, I think that's why also I think next gen EU might be important because not there are now some established ways of perhaps doing this, right? Uh, that you can fall back on, and you know then then you first have to argue what, what I mean. Now you can always say, well, why don't we do it like last time? Uh, and, and then it's much harder to, to argue against that, whereas if there's no blueprint, then of course everybody will just say, well, we'll do it this way, this way, but, and everybody will propose whatever's good for them. So I think the fact that there was really no institutionalization, that there was no sort of beforehand planning for this kind of event really made it harder. Thank you very much. So lessons have been learned. I'm not sure if um, Catherine or Stella want to add something or also concur in that conclusion. Yeah. Maybe just a, a word, um, yes, that we see a huge difference now with this, uh, with the resilience and recovery um, facility, because now uh, uh, we don't have the IMF there, yeah? So the EU in the Eurozone crisis didn't have the confidence of not only the, the mechanisms, as Stephanie said, and the institutions, but not even the confidence to try to, to go ahead with these projects by itself. Now it does. So everything is now embedded in, in, in the institutions in the European semester and in a supranational kind of uh, 
um, framework. Of course, the member states can stop uh, things through the council, but it's a, certainly there were things there in the Eurozone crisis that we couldn't even imagine doing and we're doing them now. So certainly a lot to, to learn about European governance. Thank you, I see Matthias. Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question, Sarah. I think one of the most striking things of the coronavirus crisis is how toxic the ESM proved to be, right? I mean, the first package, I don't know if people even remember this, but in April 2020 that was put together was a whole series of loans, right? The, the SURE package was part of it, but of course the ESM put together, I think, 240 billion euros worth of, of loans. Of course, from a transatlantic perspective, people were immediately saying, well, you need at least a few trillion, right? The, the way even the Trump administration was putting together. But what's interesting is that not a single country has tapped into these loans. You could understand it from the Italian government and the Five Star Movement, who of course campaigned against this. But even when Mario Draghi became prime minister, he stayed away from it, right? I mean, he tapped into both grants and loans of Next Generation EU that were jointly financed, but he stayed away from ESM, which it would have been political suicide for him to do so. So I think that's what's interesting when, when Stephanie talking about there was no institutional mechanism, that's absolutely true. But it seems to me that the ones that they have built are um, have become so politicized domestically that, that they won't be that easy to use. So that's where I think next generation EU kind of learned those lessons from it. And maybe that will be the thing to, to build on. But that, that, that is, you know, we, we, have, we have to see uh, in the future. And also, let's not forget the ECB has gone so far beyond what it's doing now that many countries don't want to borrow from next generation EU because they can borrow cheaper themselves on, on financial markets. One would like to think that that's not going to continue forever either, right? And that at some point, maybe then the ESM will look uh, to be a, a more, um, a better alternative. Great. Thank you very much. I think uh, I will uh, close the conversation now. Um, I would like to thank the audience and to thank uh, our authors, but also our discussants for the excellent remarks and insightful comments. Um, we've covered, uh, yes, a lot of different um, aspects and I'm sure um, that it has encouraged a lot of uh, participants in the audience to buy these books and to put them on their summer reading list. Um, maybe their summer, uh, their next um, syllabus for their students, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. Um, and uh, we will, of course, post this uh, video and summary uh, of the books uh, on our website, uh, Next to UK and Center for European Research at Queen Mary University of London. Thank you to all of you. <laughs>